This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 138, Stevie Osborne. On December 23, 2019, two-year-old Stevie Osborne was rushed to the hospital in Kansas City, Missouri, suffering from bruises all over her body, two skull fractures and massive bleeding on the brain. After Stevie died during life-saving surgery, her death was ruled a homicide caused by blunt force trauma to the head. A report by Child Services pointed the finger squarely at two individuals, but a shocking act by the prime suspect in Stevie's murder brought the police investigation to a screeching halt. In this episode, you'll hear my conversation with Stevie's dad, Gary Osborne, who refuses to give up hope of seeing justice for his baby girl. This is the story of a little girl whose violent death has received almost zero media coverage and has never resulted in criminal charges. It's also the story of a heartbroken family who will do anything they can to keep her memory alive and to get some semblance of justice for her murder. This is the infuriating story of Stevie Osborne. Quick shout out to my newest patrons, Christina M. from Patterson, California, and Sandra E. and Jess and Bean from Mr. Dress Up's Tickle Trunk. Thank you all so much for helping to keep this show going. To make a pledge, you can visit patreon.com slash stlcpod. Today's story is an unusual one, not unfortunately for the circumstances, which are all too common, but because of the fact that Stevie's story has received next to no media attention whatsoever. The majority of what I'm about to tell you came from other sources, including unredacted official documents. I truly appreciate Stevie's family for bringing her story to my attention so I can bring it to yours. I originally released this episode on March 23rd, 2023. Shortly after that, I pulled the episode down. I have since re-edited the entire episode, which I believe now better reflects an objective view of the case. A quick disclaimer before I begin. All parties are innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. In audio clips and interviews, the statements and opinions expressed are the speaker's own and do not necessarily represent my views. Gary Lee Osborne and Abigail Jean Morris met in 2013, a few months after Gary graduated from Park Hill High School in Kansas City, Missouri where Abby graduated the following year. The two began dating as soon as they met, and eventually, 18-year-old Gary moved in with Abby, her mother Mindy, Mindy's mother Carol, and Mindy's boyfriend at the time, Aaron. After high school, Abby worked at a couple of different jobs, eventually deciding to pursue a healthcare career and becoming a nursing assistant with the intention of attending nursing school. The couple had married and moved into their own little place by the time their daughter, Stevie Lynn Allison Osborne, was born on April 28, 2017, in Kansas City. She was named after Gary's father, Steve, and one of Stevie's middle names was in honor of Abby's sister, Allison, who died years before during infancy. When Stevie was five months old, Abby filed for divorce. With no other options, Gary ended up moving back in with his parents. Shortly after Gary moved out, he received a call at work from his father, Steve, letting him know that a police officer was at the house to speak with Gary. The officer came to visit Gary at work to provide him with paperwork about a failed emergency ex parte order of protection his soon-to-be ex-wife had tried to take out on him, claiming that Gary had tried to choke her in 2015. The judge threw out her request. 
The matter was finally settled after a short but bitter custody battle, during which Gary was not allowed to see Stevie for three months, thereby missing her first Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's Eve. In January of 2018, the court decided that Gary and Abby would share joint legal custody of Stevie, who would live primarily with her mother. Gary was ultimately ordered to pay Abby just over $700 per month in child support. Their custody arrangement gave Gary every other weekend with his daughter, as well as ultimately an overnight each week. Sometime in early 2019, Abby began dating a man named Joseph Chilson, who had been a high school classmate of hers and Gary's. Abby and Joe soon moved in together, sharing an apartment in the Wild Oak Apartment Homes at 7945 North Flint Rock Road in Kansas City. Gary last saw two-and-a-half-year-old Stevie alive on the morning of Thursday, December 19, 2019, when he dropped his daughter off at her great-grandma Virginia's house. He had given Stevie a bath the night before, at which time her pale skin was unmarked and unbruised. According to a later report from the Missouri Department of Social Services Children's Division, on the evening of December 21, 2019, while Abby was working at her job as a critical care nurse at St. Luke's Hospital in Kansas City, she received a text message from Joe, who said that Stevie was sick and throwing up. When Abby arrived home at around 2 a.m. on the 22nd, Joe told her that Stevie had tripped over the family dog, hitting her forehead on the tile floor and leaving bruises that can be seen in photos taken later that day at a Christmas party Abby held in their apartment. As a critical care nurse, even one who never received formal training in neurological assessments as Abby later claimed, there's no way she didn't know that a head injury accompanied by vomiting could indicate a serious medical problem. Even so, Abby didn't seek medical attention for Stevie. At the Christmas party on December 22nd, according to the Children's Division report, many family members in attendance told social workers that they witnessed Stevie L. Osborne projectile vomiting and being warm to the touch, and that Abby allowed only Joe and no one else to change Stevie's clothing during the party every time she threw up on herself. The same family members reported that Stevie projectile vomited multiple times during the party and that they were concerned about the numerous contusions around the forehead-slash-ear areas, along with a bump on the right side of her forehead. Following that Christmas party, Abby's maternal grandmother, Carol Dixon, posted two photos on Facebook depicting Abby in red plaid, one-piece pajamas, with Stevie sitting in her lap, wearing pink footy PJs, with a large bruise in the middle of her little forehead. Along with the photos, Carol wrote, Celebrated Christmas with Abby Jean, Stevie, and Joseph Chilson. Yesterday, poor little Stevie was sick with a stomach virus and not much into the holiday cheer. Get better, little one. Grandma loves you bunches. The DSS report also mentioned that Abby herself admitted that she noticed severe contusions on Stevie L. Osborne's ears, as well as her forehead and neck. That evening, after noticing Stevie's injuries, Abby reported getting into an argument with Joe, which she said escalated into physical violence when he pulled Abby's hair and threw her on the bed while she was holding Stevie. Abby said she considered but decided against calling the police, saying that she and Joe decided later that night that he would move out shortly. The next morning, Abby made the fateful decision to leave her two-and-a-half-year-old daughter in the care of a man she had just broken up with the night before. Several hours after leaving for work that morning, Abby received a phone call from Joe who told her that Stevie had fallen out of bed and wasn't breathing. Abby told Joe to call 911, which somehow wasn't his first thought. After Joe called 911, officers from the Kansas City Police Department and paramedics responded to the apartment to attend to a medical emergency. Inside the apartment, first responders found two-and-a-half-year-old Stevie Osborne covered in bruises and unresponsive. Stevie was taken by ambulance to Liberty Hospital in cardiac arrest. She was without a pulse for 20 minutes. Doctors determined that she would need emergency surgery, so Stevie was taken by ambulance to Children's Mercy Hospital in downtown Kansas City in critical condition. There, a neurosurgeon informed Stevie's parents, Gary and Abby, that their daughter's injuries were not accidental and were, in fact, inflicted by someone. She was rushed into surgery for a craniotomy, which is the temporary removal of part of the skull, to provide access to the brain. However, Stevie coded in the operating room, and despite medical staff's best life-saving efforts, including CPR and defibrillation, Stevie was pronounced dead at 1.28 p.m. on December 23, 2019.
Because of the nature of Stevie's injuries, staff at both Liberty Hospital and Children's Mercy suspected child abuse and made reports to DSS, which immediately began an investigation into Stevie's death. Stevie's funeral was held at Park Hill Baptist Church in Kansas City on Saturday, December 28, 2019. Abby provided me with the words she spoke at Stevie's funeral, which read as follows. Stevie is love in the purest way, which is why I want to start off by reading 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Stevie's love is so much more than all of those things, though. Stevie's love is beautiful in the way she smiled, happy in the way she laughed, sweet in the way she asked for hugs and kisses, giving in the way she always wanted to hold you and not the other way around, reassuring in the way she would grab your face and tell you, you're so nice, or you're my best friend, fun in the way she would run around chasing the dog and play airplane, adventurous in the way she wanted me to carry her up the big kid stuff at Penguin Park, wild in the way she would run around the store and think it was a game, high energy in the way she was always ready for another vacation, Curious in the way she was always getting into something, whether it was the cabinets for chocolate chips or my clothes drawers. Helpful in the way she carried in groceries with me and tried to dress me. Independent in the way she wanted to feed herself and get herself on the potty, even if it meant she had to do a complete 360. Comforting in the way she would rub your back when you cried and tell you that it's okay or lay her sweet head on your chest. Strong in the way she would lift weights with me at the gym. Inspiring in the way she gave me the motivation to finish nursing school and go into critical care. Contagious in the way she lit up a room and immediately filled the room with positive energy. Magical in the way she allowed me to feel her presence the other day when I couldn't sleep. After her funeral, Stevie was buried in a tiny pink casket in the White Chapel Cemetery in Gladstone. Of her daughter, Abby later wrote on Facebook, I miss you telling me to go to work and make money and I miss your Nana dropping you off at my work. My co-workers would help keep an eye on you while I finished up charting. I loved sharing you with the rest of my tribe. You were in love with my stethoscope, and I loved the idea of you growing up to be a nurse like me. Gary's sister, Kimberly, also later posted about her niece. After having three boys, I was so excited when you came. To have a little head to put bows on, a reason to buy pink, we finally had a little princess. You were so cute and happy. But then I had my own little princess, and it made me so happy to think she would have an awesome older girl cousin, someone to have sleepovers with, play in makeup, and eventually talk about boys with. But instead of all that, we are forced to celebrate your birthday without you here. And I hate that. I hate that you will never get to learn to ride a bike. I hate that I'll never get to put a band-aid on your boo-boo after falling off that bike. I hate that you will never lose your first tooth. I hate that you will never learn to tie your shoes. I hate that you will never have your first day of school. I hate that you will never know how much your cousins adored you. I hate that your Mimi has five grandbabies but can only hold four. I hate that you will never know how proud your daddy was to be your daddy. I hate that your Christmas presents are still wrapped under my bed. And I hate that such a perfect, innocent girl was taken from us while there are monsters who remain here. But I love that I got to be your aunt, even if only for a little while. Daycare teacher Bailey Bennion wrote on her memory wall on December 27, 2019. I'm so very sorry for your loss, Gary. We had so many good memories together with Stevie. I will never thank you enough for letting me be a part of this beautiful little girl's life. She is the reason I stayed at the daycare as long as I did. I will forever cherish the moments of her running to me in the mornings and evening, saying good morning or goodbye. I will forever cherish always doing her hair and you thanking me a thousand times because you couldn't figure it out yet. I love you both so much. In addition to the Children's Division's investigation, Kansas City Police also investigated Stevie's death. In March of 2020, police announced that on February 20th, Stevie's death was ruled a homicide. They did not provide any further details about Stevie's injuries or her cause of death. According to police spokesman Sergeant Jacob Bakina, they could not release Stevie's cause of death because those details were part of the ongoing investigation. We are hopeful a case can be submitted soon for charges, which will yield many more details. 
He added that they had identified a person of interest, but they had not arrested or charged anyone in Stevie's murder. The KCPD also issued a statement saying that they were still investigating Stevie's case in the hopes of submitting a case file to the Clay County Prosecutor for consideration of charges. The Kansas City Star, a local newspaper, only found out about Stevie's death being ruled a homicide when they contacted the police to verify the number of homicides that occurred in the city in 2019 because the newspaper maintains homicide data in the metro area. When the newspaper contacted Abby for comment, she said her daughter was a sweet and innocent child who was about as cute as they come. I firmly believe that if the most miserable person in the world came in contact with her, she could bring them joy. She was fun. We took road trips all the time. She was my best friend. She deserved a lot better than this. That was one of the only scraps of media coverage Stevie's death received. Aside from a couple of brief articles in other sources also stating that Stevie's death was ruled a homicide after the police finally announced it, there has been no other media coverage of this sweet little girl's murder. I'll pause here for a quick word from my sponsors. Also in March of 2020, Stevie's father, Gary Lee Osborne, received a letter from the Missouri Department of Social Services Children's Division. Dated March 26, 2020, the letter informed Gary that the Children's Division had concluded the investigation it began on December 23, 2019. The investigation was begun based on the allegation of child neglect against Abigail Jean Osborne and the letter declared the department had made a preliminary finding of neglect by preponderance of evidence against Abby, as well as preliminary findings of physical abuse and neglect by preponderance of evidence against Joseph James Chilson. The Children's Division's report from the investigation included the following information, which I've paraphrased only slightly due to the constant repetition of the party's full names. Abigail J. Osborne disclosed to Children's Division that she is a critical care nurse at St. Luke's Hospital, but primarily handled patients in cardiac distress. Abigail admitted to Children's Division she had zero training in neuroassessments, but on the day of the holiday party, believed Stevie L. Osborne had a mild concussion. By her own admission, Abigail treated Stevie's mild concussion with Dramamine and Sprite. Abigail admitted to a social worker at Children's Mercy Hospital that when Joseph Chilson became angry, he would punch things. Abigail was aware of Joseph's violent tendencies and after becoming embroiled in a physical altercation where law enforcement contact was pondered, still chose to leave her daughter, Stevie, in the care of Joseph, who is suspected of causing the death of Stevie. After speaking with all parties involved in this case, Children's Division has determined Abigail did not seek medical intervention for Stevie, as Stevie's symptoms were indicative of a serious medical condition. After speaking with all parties involved in this case, Children's Division also determined that Abigail failed to protect Stevie by leaving Stevie in the care, custody, and control of Joseph Chilson, whom Abigail alleged physically abused her. The report also found that Joseph James Chilson was responsible for Stevie's care, custody, and control at the time of the incident that ultimately caused her death, stating that Joe lived in the home and often babysat Stevie when Abby had to work. Another section of the report read, Joseph Chilson disclosed to Children's Division that he noticed severe contusions on Stevie L. Osborne's ears as well as her forehead and neck. Joseph also disclosed to Children's Division that after noticing the contusions on Stevie the evening of Sunday, December 22, 2019, he and Abigail J. Osborne got into an argument that escalated into physical violence. Joseph is alleged to have become violent with Abigail by pulling her by the hair and throwing her on the bed while she was holding Stevie. Joseph stated to Children's Division this was an accident and denied forcefully shoving Abigail onto the couch. Joseph disclosed to Children's Division that he and Abigail discussed the event and made the decision Joseph would move out of the residence within a few days. The report went on to say that Joe told the Children's Division that he thought Stevie's maternal grandpa, Dennis Morris, had caused the bruises on Stevie's abdomen on December 19th while she was at her great-grandma Virginia Sellers' house. He said he showed the bruises to Abby the next day, but Abby didn't think they were serious. Joe also said when he babysat Stevie on the evening of December 21st, she was throwing up, and he claimed he saw her trip over the family dog and hit her head on the tile floor. During the Christmas party the next day, Joe said, Stevie was still throwing up, so he took responsibility for changing Stevie's clothes every time she needed it, 
claiming he was trying to help Abby by preventing anyone else at the party from changing Stevie, because that supposedly makes sense. By the time Joe babysat Stevie again on the morning of December 23rd, he said, she was still throwing up. Joe told the children's division that he always told Abby about any concerns he had about Stevie, but that Abby never took them seriously. The children's division determined that Joe was neglectful by failing to seek medical intervention for Stevie for what was obviously a serious medical condition. Joe denied being physically abusive toward Abby or Stevie, but the DSS report determined that Stevie's multiple injuries were caused other than by accidental means and were too severe to be the result of spanking or other reasonable discipline. What exactly were those injuries? Stevie's autopsy was conducted at 9 a.m. on Christmas Eve of 2019 by Dr. Altaf Hossein, coroner and chief medical examiner at Frontier Forensics Midwest Moore in Kansas City. The autopsy report stated, According to the initial investigational information, the decedent was a two-year-old white female child that was reportedly vomiting with abdominal pain on 12-23-2019. While under the care of her mother's boyfriend, the decedent reportedly became unresponsive and collapsed at her residence. 911 was notified, and EMS services transported the decedent to the emergency room. Upon arrival, the decedent was noted to have multiple contusions of the head and abdomen. Once stabilized, the decedent was in agonal breathing and diagnosed with parietal and occipital skull fractures, diffuse subdural hematoma with midline shift, and an abdominal abnormality. Despite efforts, she was ultimately pronounced dead on 12-23-19 at 13-28. According to Dr. Hossein, Stevie was just over three feet tall and weighed 38 pounds. The right side of her head was shaved due to medical intervention, and the rest of her medium-length blonde hair was braided. The report listed several injuries, both external and internal. These included contusions on Stevie's forehead, scalp, upper lip, lower chest, abdomen, pelvis, both hands, right wrist, and lower left leg, as well as hemorrhages in the abdomen and the bowel, two skull fractures, multiple hemorrhages between the skull and the scalp, and a massive subdural hematoma, or bleeding on the brain, on the right side of Stevie's head, which caused a midline shift. Otherwise, her body was that of a normal two-year-old girl with no bone fractures or abnormalities. Dr. Hossein ruled Stevie's death a homicide caused by blunt force trauma to the head. The only reason I'm giving you this information when the police refused to make it public is because the ongoing criminal investigation ended when, on January 6, 2021, the prime suspect in Stevie's murder, Joseph James Chilson, ended his own life with a bullet in his father's bathtub. At that point, the Kansas City Police Department reportedly told family members that Joe's suicide was as good as an admission of guilt and that they would no longer be pursuing criminal charges against Abby despite the Children's Division's determination that Abby was also responsible for Stevie's neglect. Unless there was a note or a confession that I'm not aware of, Joe's suicide is not an admission of guilt in any way, shape, or form. Could it mean he was guilty? Absolutely. Does it necessarily mean that? No, it doesn't. As I mentioned earlier, The investigation by the Missouri DSS Children's Division pointed the finger at both Joe and Abby for Stevie's physical abuse and neglect. Because of the division's findings, Abby faces the withdrawal of her nursing license in the state of Missouri. As is her right under the law, Abby decided to fight the division's ruling. In April of 2020, she filed a civil lawsuit against Children's Division Director Jennifer Tidball and the Children's Division itself. Before the lawsuit could be decided, in October of 2021, Jennifer Tidball stepped down as the director and returned to the position of chief operating officer. That did not change the direction of Abby's lawsuit. During a long-awaited bench trial that finally took place on March 7, 2023, before Judge Timothy Fluke, evidence and testimony were presented, and the cause was taken under advisement. According to spectators present in the courtroom on March 7, Abby's paternal grandmother, Connie Morris, told the judge that during the Christmas party on December 22, 2019, she didn't notice any bruising on Stevie and that her great-granddaughter did not throw up during the party. This is in direct conflict with the previous statements of multiple family members to police and the children's division, including Connie herself, that Stevie was clearly bruised and vomiting. At the conclusion of the hearing, all parties were granted a month to submit findings and facts and conclusions of law for the judge's consideration. 
On April 10, 2023, the judge granted a joint motion for continuance, allowing both parties until April 14 to submit their respective judgments. On April 14, Attorney Elizabeth Allen Comfort electronically filed findings of fact, conclusions of law, and judgment on behalf of the Department of Social Services Children's Division. It does not appear that Abby or her attorney filed anything, either before or after the deadline. As of June 8th, the judge has yet to make a decision or schedule any future court dates in the case. I'll pause here for another quick sponsor break, and then you'll hear my conversation with Stevie's dad, Gary Osborne. What type of person would you say Abby is? She doesn't seem to have any emotions about really anything. Her emotions are always a, a mystery to yeah, everybody involved. And so I never knew if things were going well in our relationship. I never knew if they were going poorly. I would find out by her actions, never by any sort of conversation that we had. I don't know. It was a, like an impossible person to be with as soon as we got married. Uh, our relationship was pretty good before we got married, but I was very young and, and very stupid. And I hate to say this, but at the time I was in love and I ignored so many red flags, right? And a lot of things that I look back on now and I'm like, wow, if I had noticed that, maybe I could have saved Stevie or maybe I could have, you know, I live in this constant state of what if, which through therapy, thank God for therapy, I am not in a constant state of what if, but it's hard not to be when you think about what you could have seen, what you could have done. The worst case scenario actually happened to you. So I can completely understand that feeling of regret and what if, what could I have done differently? Then to touch on like the manipulative stuff, I get this letter the day she tells me that we're, we're going to separate that says I owe, you know, X amount of dollars to children's division already in child support. It's like six months of child support. But the whole time she lived with me, I was paying bills. I was taking care of her, taking care of Stevie. It was it was weird to owe back child support for somebody that I've been providing for for six months. But yeah, I didn't know that we were separating. I didn't know that that's what we were working towards. I thought I was doing the right thing in the relationship by coming home from work and then either, you know, buying dinner on my way home or making dinner once I got home. You know, I wouldn't get myself a drink or get Stevie anything without asking Abby if she needed anything. I thought I was doing the right thing. So I thought the relationship was going well. Um, and then one day she told me, it was like, Hey, I'm, I need you to get out of this house. You know, we live here together, but you've got to leave because Stevie's bedroom is here. And then she told me about the divorce. She told me about how I owed this much money in child support. And I had no idea what to do. You know, I panicked immediately. Like I called my parents and I was like, Hey, I think I have to move back in with you guys. And then not long after that, I get a call from my dad. And he's like, hey, there's a cop at our front door for you. Something about about Abby. I'm like, OK, so I get on the phone with the cop and I'm like, hey, I don't I don't know what to do. I'm at work right now. Can can you maybe wait? Can we reschedule? And he's like, no, I have to get you this today. So I go into my boss's office and I'm like, hey, this is really embarrassing. But would you mind if I just sit in your office and have a police officer come in? And thank God I had an amazing boss. Kim Romo is my boss at Motion Industries, and she pretty much told me, was like, you can sit in here, the cop can come inside, you guys can have your conversation, I'll leave the office, it can be private, nobody else has to know about it. So she kept me from the embarrassing, my wife is filing a restraining order against me in front of my coworkers, so that was, thank you, Kim Romo. <laughs> so the officer shows up with this emergency ex parte in hand, and he tells me, he's like, hey, you know, they didn't have sufficient evidence to grant this ex parte, but you will have to appear in court. So here is a copy of this ex parte that failed. She said that I had choked her in 2015. So after all of this happened, I guess Abby got married somewhere in there. Yeah. So I actually had met Corey a few times at this point. I'd been to his house to pick up Stevie a few times. So I met Corey, but I had no idea that they had gotten married at some point. I don't know. I don't know when they got married. Uh, all I know is that they were married sometime between me and when she started seeing Joe. Do you know anything about her relationship with Joe or did you basically learn all about that after the fact? I pretty much learned all about uh, Joe after the fact. We went trick-or-treating together, uh, me, Abby, Joe, and Stevie uh, in 2019, October 2019. 
and he seemed like a reasonable individual, but I, I also married Abby. At the time, I thought that he was a decent individual. Like, out of all the people she had dated, Corey was the only one that seemed to at least be somewhat of an adult and have his life figured out. Corey had a child of his own, but Joe didn't seem like he was going to be a harmful individual. But obviously, hindsight, twenty twenty. Did you learn after the fact anything about Abby's relationship with him? Or other than the CPS letter, was that pretty much all you had the chance to find out? The CPS report or the Children's Division letter is when I found out what I, I know today about their relationship. And I still don't really know much about them two together. I know that uh, when I met them, we had gone costume shopping for Stevie to go trick-or-treating. And then we had gone trick-or-treating together. What was Stevie dressed as for her Halloween costume? She was Little Bo Peep. (laughs) How did you find out what was going on with Stevie going into the hospital that day? Yeah, so I was at work. Uh, I worked at a place called Unilever in Independence, Missouri. I was on site. I worked for Motion Industries, but I I ran the storeroom at Unilever. And I got a phone call from Abby, which is pretty unusual to get a phone call from her during the day. And she called me at 8.50 a.m. on December 23rd. And she said, hey, Stevie's at Liberty Hospital. She's unresponsive. You need to get there now. I made it in about 15 minutes, and I think it's probably about a 30-minute drive. And I called my mom while I was on my way. Uh, I told my mom, I was like, I don't know what's going on, but you have to get there. Then I get another call from Abby, and she said, and I quote, I don't know what's going on. I think she's dead. You were actually there when Stevie was taken in for surgery. Is that right? Yeah, so we started out our day there at Liberty Hospital. I feel so bad for those people because I showed up and I asked them, where's my daughter? They they asked me who I was. I told them who I was and I threatened them. I was like, you you take me to my kid right now or I will hurt you. And they didn't know who I was, what was going on. And all they know is that this little girl showed up. You know, she hadn't been breathing for 20 minutes. And now there's this guy making threats to people. There's some guy that shows up being violent. And so they, I'm assuming, thought I was responsible for what had happened at first and They took me into a room where I sat down and talked to some police. And then my mom showed up and I talked to the police with my mom. And uh, they were able to verify the timeline of the story based on my story and Abby's story. And so they found out that, you know, I hadn't seen Stevie since Thursday morning when I dropped her off at her grandma Virginia's house. And when I last saw Stevie, she didn't have a single bruise on her. You know, I'd given her a bath the night before, changed her pull-ups because she was potty training. So I don't know how you wouldn't notice something like that if you were a parent that gave a shit. And so when I had her on Thursday morning, and overnight on Wednesday night, she was you know, spot free, no bruises, no bumps, nothing out of the ordinary. And so that's when they had decided to let me let me go see her at Liberty Hospital. So as I'm walking back to see Stevie at Liberty Hospital is when they decided that they can't you know, do the, the appropriate life saving measures at this hospital. She needs to go to Children's Mercy downtown. So that's when they took her to Children's Mercy downtown by ambulance. And we just followed the ambulance to that hospital. And at Children's Mercy is when they were going to do the surgery. I walked in and a doctor told me, uh, I think it was the surgeon, to be honest, that day is a a blur. The surgeon had told me, he's like, hey, you know, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but this was not the result of someone tripping over a dog or falling off of their, their toddler bed, that this was done on purpose intentionally, that somebody had hurt my baby on purpose which I immediately assumed it was Joe. And then I was immediately angry with Abigail because she put Stevie in that position. What they told me, and I sat with, you know, several different hospital staff members and for the day, basically, they let me go back. They let me tell Stevie I love her. And this is one of the things that like really cuts me deep is that I gave her a kiss and I told her that everything was going to be okay. And, you know, hindsight, everything was not okay. But without a pulse for 20 minutes, I don't know much about the way the body works. I'm not a medical professional by any means. And and so I thought, so she didn't have a pulse for 20 minutes, but she does now. So in my head, I'm like, okay, well, you know, someday I get to take my baby home. Maybe not today, but someday. And another positive that's going to come from this is I never have to send her back to Abby because she never wanted to go to Abby's house. Anytime Abby came to pick her up, she was clawing and prying and trying to get back to me. And anytime I picked her up from Abby, she was the happiest baby in the world. So to me, what's happening, while it is a bad thing, there is a silver lining. And that is that I am never going to have to send her back to that house. And at some point, I'm going to get to take her home, just maybe not today. 
but not having a pulse for 20 minutes means your your organs are not getting the oxygen that they require, including your brain. And so the doctor came in and told me after I had sat for a while, he's like, hey, I'm, you know, we're getting ready to take her back for surgery. But I want to tell you that she has a midline ship. Well, I didn't know what that meant. Um, but that means that she was hit hard enough that her brain is no longer communicating with the rest of her body properly. And then they told me that she had no reaction to light in her eyes, which I still, to this day, only somewhat know what that means. But now I know that it means that she's brain dead. And so they took her back for the craniotomy, shaved part of her head to do the surgery. And uh, I think before they even started cutting is when they decided that she's not going to make it. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. Yeah, they actually took us in the room together. They asked for both parents to meet the, the doctor in the room, and they had the, I think they're called a hospital chaplain. I don't, somebody from the church maybe that works at the hospital. I'm, I'm not positive. I, I walk into this room, and Abby's in there with the surgeon, and I walk in, and they were waiting for you know us both to be there to tell us. But they told me and told Abby that, you know, unfortunately, the life-saving measures that we took, they weren't, they weren't enough. Um, you know, we're, we're very sorry, but, you, you know, Stevie's not going to get to go home. And that, to me, felt like a little misleading. And uh, I'm like, what do you mean she's not going to get to go home? Like, yeah, I know she's not going to get to go home today. Like, she's obviously very hurt, but it's like, what what happens now? And they're like, well, we're not going to do the surgery. So I'm still not understanding, like, why are you not going to do the surgery? And that's when they explain that, no, sir, your your daughter's not going to make it. She's She's going to pass away. So I'm I'm as devastated as any person could be and I think should be. And Abby just dials her mom, Mindy. She calls her and with no emotion, no tears, nothing at all, just says, you can tell everybody to go home. She's dead. I feel stupid because I wasn't understanding what they were saying, because to me, I, I always try to take best case scenario. And my best case scenario was that, OK, yeah, she doesn't get to go home today, whatever. Like she'll get to go home someday. You guys just need to continue doing what you're doing to make sure she's okay. I didn't know what a midline shift was. I didn't know what having no pulse for 20 minutes does to your body. I, you know, I was ignorant. So he had to basically just say, you know, she's, she's dead. And so I didn't, I wasn't following. And so that was a, one of the hardest conversations I think I've ever had to have in my life. Wow. I'm so sorry. It, it I can't tell you enough. It's just, it breaks my heart, even just imagining it. And you've been living through it ever since. So I went and I, planned the funeral and uh, I was actually going to pay for the funeral and my company stepped in and had wrote a check for the funeral. So my, my work actually paid for it from the Carlisle Fraser fund, which is a trauma fund for you know, our employees, which was incredible. You know, it was not expensive. Those little pink casket was pretty pricey, but uh, my work took care of it. And it was, it was really nice of them to do. And they all came to the funeral and everything. But so I planned the funeral and uh, I didn't know what to do. Right. I didn't know if I should have Abby there or not, because I didn't know if Abby was guilty or not. The criminal investigation took so long and my parents were both very mad at me for allowing her to show up. My whole family was pissed off at me for allowing to show up. We let her family sit on the left of the church. My family sit on the right of the church. I called the Platte County Sheriff's Office and told them that they should probably have some cops here because I knew that I wasn't going to hurt anybody, but I couldn't guarantee that my family wouldn't hurt anybody. Emotions were very high. It was an open casket funeral. I just didn't want someone to see Stevie and then immediately get upset and then just attack someone. So I made sure there were cops there. But here's my, my thinking behind it is that if she was innocent, then Stevie deserves to have her mom there. Yeah. And if she's not innocent, then I planned the funeral. I have to live with that every day for the rest of my life. And I'm fine with, you know, holding that burden. Yeah. But I didn't want to deprive Stevie of having her mom there if her mom was innocent. It was Stevie's last day, you know, her last day that I'd ever get to see her again, the last day that anybody would ever get to see her again. And I know she was already passed, but I wanted it to be the best last day that anybody could ever have. And yeah, my family was pretty upset with me for allowing her to be there and allowing her to speak. Did you bury Stevie with any of her special things? And did she wear a special little outfit? That's where the story gets really irritating is that I told Abigail, you know, I took care of the funeral. Uh, I want you to take care of the burial. And so I find out about four hours after Stevie was buried that they did a burial at Whitechapel and none of my family was informed. So none of us got to be there when Stevie was placed in her final spot. Oh, my God. Did you know there was a DSS investigation going on? 
I did on December 24th. So the day after she passed away is when I think I actually may have been the first person to speak to children's division. You know, I got the redacted report, of course, where they had to black out the stuff that was used in the criminal investigation. But I think I might have been the first person to speak to her name is Patricia with children's division. I spoke to her first thing on December 24th, you know, the morning of December 24th. I know they spoke to a number of family members. Do you know who they spoke with that were actually at that Christmas party on the 22nd? Yeah, actually, they spoke to everybody that was at the Christmas party. I believe they spoke to Connie, Dennis, Carol, Virginia. They spoke to all the adults that were at the party. And did they all pretty much give the same story? Because I know there's been some discrepancy since in what Abby's side of the family is saying about occurred at that party. Yeah, so the original stories from all of them were that they had seen the bruising on her forehead, ear, and neck, and that they saw her projectile vomiting. All of them actually told me and Children's Division that they wish they would have called me because they knew something was wrong. So it's in my opinion that everybody that was at that Christmas party should be charged with failure to protect, but you have to establish that you're a primary care provider to be charged with something like that. But they all failed my daughter that day. Everybody that was at that Christmas party failed Stevie that day. The stories that they gave on the stand during the bench trial were vastly different from the stories that they gave to Children's Division when the original investigation was conducted. So I am a firm believer that Abigail herself, Connie Morris, and Carol Dixon committed perjury in court. And I'm sure because our criminal system is flawed, nothing will ever come of that. But I think they lied. You know, they lied in court. Now kind of going back on what they originally said to Children's Division, they said that they didn't see any of the bruising on the neck or the ear, uh, that yes, she had a bump on her forehead. And some of them even changed the story from she had projectile vomited six times to well, I never even saw her throw up. I know that she might have thrown up one time. I'll tell you from my side of the story for a minute that it was very difficult for me to lose my daughter. But for my mom, you know, me and my daughter lived with my mom. You know, my daughter was very close to my mom. And so my mom had to not just lose Stevie. She had to watch me go through losing Stevie. So I think it was probably more difficult for my mom than it was for me. So when I think about the other side of the family, you know, when I think about Abby's mother, Mindy, not only did she lose Stevie, but she also had to watch Abby lose Stevie. But watching Abby lose Stevie had to have been a little weird because at least some part of Mindy knows that Abby is responsible, that Abby should have protected Stevie. So I think Mindy's in a very weird position with Abby. And what is your mom's name? Is she Stevie's Mimi? Yeah, that's Stevie's Mimi. That is uh, Valerie. She has a memorial set up in her house. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah, we've got all of Stevie's sloths. <laughs> we've got her bears. We've got all of her pictures. You know, when you think about like a shrine for people, this is definitely a shrine. I'm actually, I came over here to my parents' house to do this interview in Stevie's room today. So, Oh, that's awesome. I'm so glad to hear that. So she liked sloths? Oh, she loved them. She actually, while I was working, I was a customer service rep at a, a company that doesn't pay the customer service reps incredibly well, but most of my money was going to Abigail. And so the nights that I had Stevie, I didn't have a ton of extra money to do stuff with. So we would go to Five Below and we would just go get toys. And one day she had her little overalls on and she ran into Five Below and she grabbed a pink sloth and a blue sloth and she tucked them under each arm and she didn't even want to pay for him. She just turned around and started walking towards the door. These are mine she got now. In there, found what she wanted and then turned on her way out. And so uh, then she just kind of started accumulating some sloth toys and she loved Frozen and all of her sloths and her Frozen toys. And I'm snuggled up to her Olaf and everything right now. So oh, I'm so glad you have that. I'm glad you have the ability to do that. I love it in here. It is uh, not the easiest place to come sit down and, and be, but you know, it's, you feel really close to her when you're in this room. I bet. So after the funeral, you knew that there was an investigation going on, I guess, from DSS's side and the police. Were the police good about keeping in touch with you about how that was all going? You know, I like Detective Cook a lot. But as a parent who just lost a child, they, there was not enough information. And obviously they couldn't share the information with me that they were getting. But I never felt like I knew or was in the loop about anything. And I just ask them that if you're not going to talk to me about it, just do the best job that you can. Mm -hmm. Dot your I's, cross your T's, and keep me in the loop whenever possible. 
I don't, I don't want to say anything bad about Detective Cook because it, I, there's nothing bad to say about him, but I do wish that I was kept in the loop more. But I understand that there was an ongoing investigation into a murder, and if I knew stuff, then I could say stuff, and I could probably mess up the investigation. But as a parent who just lost a kid, I, I absolutely did not have enough information. So they were investigating, I guess after the March letter, they were investigating both Joe and Abby. Yes. Yeah. So they had to prove that she didn't hurt Stevie. And then they also had to prove that he did. But it it had to have been an impossible task because the only explanation I've gotten so far is that the amount of force required to inflict the damage that was done couldn't have been generated by Abby. And I don't know where the science is to determine that. So, yeah, that's where I wish I had more information. Even today, I wish I had more information on how they determined that Abby didn't hit Stevie, because knowing what I know now, I I wholeheartedly believe that she is capable of doing damage and hurting Stevie physically. I just I want to know how they determined that she didn't. I want to know how they decided that it was Joe, Um, because so far they talk about his suicide as an admission of guilt, saying that he is the one that did it. The only thing that I have to go on is that uh, and I don't know much about what it takes to bruise or break or, or anything, but um, the cartilage on her ear was bruised. And apparently that is one of the hardest pieces of a human to bruise. You have to be hit incredibly hard to bruise cartilage. And so that's how they told me they determined it was Joe and not Abby. How did you find out what happened to Joe? Yeah, so I think it was January 6th of 2021. When I got a call from Detective Cook, and this is going to be graphic, but he told me that they were responding to a call from the morning of and uh, that Joe had shot himself. And I didn't know what to do. And I didn't know what emotions to have. I know it makes me sound like an insane person to say that I was I was relieved or or even maybe happy. I don't know that Joe hurt Stevie I don't know if it was Abby or if it was Joe. I, I you know, the, they told me it was Joe. Uh, so I, I kind of just have to take the word of the police. That must have been tough. When did the police tell you then that they were basically giving up on the investigation? So I never got a call from Detective Cook that they weren't going to go forward with charges against Abby. It was when I started going around the KCPD homicide unit and I started working directly with Clay County prosecutors. I started calling uh, our victim's advocate. And I called our victim's advocate nearly every day for two years. And uh, she never gave me a call back. You know, she never answered my phone calls. She never called me back. I talked to her so few times. And by so few, I mean zero that I don't even remember her name. After I got nothing from her, I started going directly to the Clay County prosecutor, Robert Sanders. And there was one day where he finally was like, "Okay, you know what? Let's get your family in here for a meeting. Right. So the court the courts had been closed because of covid for a while. And, you know, we knew that it was going to take forever. Uh, so finally, he was like, "Okay, you know, I've, I've done my research. I've got an answer for you, but I need you to come into my office. And so I walk into his office with my mom and my sister, Kimberly, and I get there and there are four armed officers standing outside of his office. So I already know going in that I'm going to get bad news. So there's just this pit in my stomach where I know that they're going to tell me that they can't charge her. And, you know, verbatim, he said, it's not illegal to be stupid and it's not illegal to be a bad mom. And, and all I could think was, Imagine if you put this woman in front of a jury of her peers. Imagine if there's another parent on the jury. Imagine if there's a nurse on the jury. They're going to convict her of abuse and neglect resulting in death, which in Missouri is a five year, five to 15 year sentence. I just couldn't believe what they were telling me. And, and, you know, Robert Sanders even said, we got the guy that hurt your daughter. And all I could think was, no, you didn't. You didn't get anybody. You didn't arrest him. Yes, you were going to arrest him, but you didn't. No, he took himself out of the equation. Yeah, Joe, he, you know, he killed himself. He took himself out of the equation. And so then to me, that immediately means look more into Abby because somebody needs to be held accountable for this. Um, but Clay County Prosecuting Office just acted like Joe's suicide was an arrest. They acted like they put him in prison for life. That is so frustrating. I cannot imagine how angry you were. No, yeah, no, I mean, my parents, my mom and sister know how angry I were. I, Sanders told me, you're not going to yell at me in my office. I said, my daughter was murdered less than five minutes from here, and you're worried about being yelled at? And that's when he asked the officers to come inside and remove me from the building. Not only he didn't understand, but he also just didn't care. And that, that hurt more than anything, is that he didn't care and that 
you know, people in, in my county, in my city, in Missouri are just okay with children being murdered and then no justice being given. I hate to say it's all over the country, but it does seem to be less important in some regions than it is in others. I'll take a moment here for one last sponsor break. So I'll explain a little bit. So what they did, the Children's Division did their investigation, and then they enter their findings. And their findings that they entered were a preponderance of evidence against Abigail um, for failure to protect Stevie. It, it, you know, she neglected to protect Stevie. So that puts you on a list. It puts you on a, a list called the Child Abuse and Neglect Registry. It's similar to a like a sex offender registry where you're on there. If you go on there, you're on there for life. So she's actually currently on the child abuse and neglect registry. But I think she sued Children's Division or the state of Missouri to take her name off of the list. That's when they did what's called a de novo review. And I think the de novo review is where there's like a nursing board, um, doctors, uh, legal professionals that all go in and determine if this is correct, if this person should be on the child abuse and neglect list. And then the bench trial that we just had was to either have the final ruling upheld where she stays on the list or if they get their outcome that they want, then she'd be removed from the list. Once it's all wrapped up, if she remains on the child abuse and neglect registry, then she will probably lose her nursing license. And she should not be able to be in a position where she is responsible for the life of another person. She shouldn't be in a position where she's a care provider at all whatsoever. That would be a victory for, for my family. We would feel we would feel like that is some sort of justice. You know, I think if she ever has another child that the state should just go in and take that child from her because, you know, there's no way that she's going to do better this time. About the bench trial on March 7th, how did that go? What what did that look like? It's a little different from a normal criminal trial. It's, since it's civil, they did, you know, in a criminal trial, the criminal gets to go first. And in the civil trial, the state of Missouri got to go first. I actually got to sit in the courtroom the whole time and be present for all of the witnesses. Uh, the first witness the state of Missouri called was Patricia, and she was the investigator from Children's Division. And she gave her story. And then they called, um, I want to say his name is, uh, he's from Frontier Forensics. He did the autopsy photos. And then the last person they called was an expert witness who is a doctor who specializes in child abuse. I feel like the cross-examination from Abby's attorney was bullshit. The lawyer just came up with a bunch of hypothetical scenarios and tried to get the expert witness, the gentleman from Frontier Forensics, it's Jim Helton from Frontier Forensics. His entire defense seemed to be, hypothetically, if the child didn't have any bruises, should you take them to the hospital? It seemed like he was only trying to get them to say that, no, Stevie didn't need to go to the hospital. But in this situation, she had bruises and was vomiting. That's you need to go to the hospital. Um, so her entire lawyer's defense was a bunch of hypotheticals. And to me, they really fell apart. Her lawyer crumbled the entire thing and they didn't have an expert witness. He didn't have a good cross-examination for our expert witness. A nice way of saying it, that guy shit the bed. And if anybody ever needs a lawyer, do not get the lawyer that Abigail had. I think that what happened on March 7th was a good thing. Unfortunately, you know, I've had to wait three and a half years already. So two months doesn't seem so bad, but they wanted 30 days for each legal party to submit proposed judgments. And then 30 days after that, the judge would make a final ruling. So by May 8th, we should know if Abby is going to be left on the child abuse and neglect registry. And she admitted on the stand that, yes, she did fail to protect Stevie on December 23rd, 2019. So I don't think there's any way that she is not going to be on the list. She did admit that on the stand. Wow. It took the lawyers six times of asking, did you fail to protect Stevie on December 23rd, 2019? Uh, and she wouldn't answer. She wouldn't answer. And on the sixth time that she answered, after six times that she was asked a question, she finally answered and she said, yes, you know, I... I guess I did fail to protect Stevie on that day. Yeah, the state's lawyers were incredible. Patricia Roth from Children's Division was incredible. Uh, Jim Helton from Frontier Forensics and the expert witness from Children's Mercy. They all did a fantastic job. And you come to find out that all of these people just 
do this job because they want justice and they and they care for children. It just felt really nice to have those people in Stevie's corner uh, because her voice was taken from her because of Abby and Joe and all of those people are giving Stevie a voice. And that's what I live to do is to give Stevie a voice. Absolutely. She deserves to be heard. So her family didn't necessarily behave well at the hearing. (laughs) Yeah. So the bailiff actually removed me from the courtroom at one point because I was nodding. The lawyers for the state of Missouri were asking Abby, did you fail to protect Stevie on that day? And I started nodding. And uh, she asked again, and I nod harder. Then Connie Morris, Abby's grandma, starts yelling. Like, can he do that? Can he fucking do that? But just like losing her mind. And so I look at her. I nod some more because I'm a smart ass. Then she goes, well, if you're allowed to do that, then just wait till what I do to you out loud in the courtroom. And so I uh, make some very not nice hand gestures at Connie. So I had to be removed from the courtroom. I got put in adult timeout by the bailiff. Um, He goes, hey, I understand your dad. And I know that this is uh, an upsetting deal for you, but uh, you have to behave. And I didn't tell you this before, but the head nodding and the gestures and the facial expressions, it's not allowed. He said it could be impacting the testimony of a witness. And I was like, hey, buddy, I'm I'm sorry. I know you got a job to do. Uh, Just come get me. You know, and uh, I'll stop whenever you decide to let me back in the courtroom. And so I missed about five minutes of testimony, but I got back in there before the judge wrapped it all up. Abby's side brought witnesses up, including Abby, Connie and Virginia, the great grandmother. Yeah, they brought witnesses up and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. They brought them up to perjure themselves. Somehow Abby's convinced them to lie for her and Connie's no surprise. But having Virginia lie for you was wild to me because Virginia, to me, always was very good to Stevie and did everything right except for the day that they went to that Christmas party. Uh, she should have called me. Uh, they should have told me what was going on. They should have told me their suspicions uh, because they communicated their suspicions to me the day after Stevie died, but not the Christmas party day. Uh, and all it would have taken is one phone call. You know, I would have been over there immediately to get Stevie. There's no doubt in my mind that I would have been there in less than 20 minutes to take my daughter out of the situation and could have saved her life. Had somebody had five seconds of courage to take that little girl out of that house. That's all it would have taken, you know, it's all it ever takes is about five to 10 seconds of of true, unimpeded courage to make a change. And they didn't have it. None of them had it. So that's all it would have taken was, you know, five seconds to give me a call or five seconds when Joe said, no, I'll change her. If any of them would have said, no, let me take care of it. It's my granddaughter or, you know, it's, it's my great granddaughter. Let me change her clothes. All they had to do was stand up to Abby or Joe for five to 15 seconds and they could have saved Stevie's life. Right. That I cannot stress enough is why I feel like telling these stories is so important because it really brings home the fact that saying something, anything can save a child's life. It really does come down to just have the courage to stand up against your own family member or whoever it is that's holding you back from doing something about it. No, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, with Stevie being the the most important thing in my world, I, I spent every dollar and every minute of my life. So in every measurable of a person's life, after Stevie was born, I spent all of it to spend as much time with her as I could. And any one of them could have earned a lifetime of more time with Stevie had they done anything about it. It's heartbreaking to think about, and they have to live with that thought. What was the situation with this hometown hero thing? She got recognized by KCTV5 News for being a nurse during COVID, which any other nurse recognized for their actions during COVID, I 100% support them as a hometown hero. But Abigail is a monster. She's the farthest thing from hero that exists in our world. And so, yeah, KCTV, that that all just came about when KCTV recognized her as a hometown hero for being on the front lines of COVID when they didn't know what was going on with the criminal case or the civil case. They didn't know anything. I feel bad for KCTV5 because my entire family called them and tore them a new ass. But they didn't know the story of why Abby's not a hero. (laughs) They just knew that she was out on the front lines of COVID. So they weren't wrong about the other nurses being hometown heroes, but to call Abby a hero was infuriating for my family. We need to talk about Stevie a little bit more before we go. What she loved and the things she said and the things you remember best about her and that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I'll just I'll rattle off a few. You know, what comes to mind the most is she was a little copycat. She did a lot of the things that I did. 
she would just run into a room and say, hi, baby. <laughs> I think one of my favorite things is uh, we would watch you know, Frozen together and I would sing the Frozen songs because we had watched Frozen so much. But the way she looked at me and the way she looked at the TV while Frozen was on or anytime Olaf said, I love warm hugs or anytime Anna was on screen, she wasn't really a big fan of Elsa. She loved Anna so much. I don't know. It was like every time I looked at her is the way she looked at everything. She loved everything so much. One of my favorite Stevie memories is of her eating her smash cake at her first birthday. <laughs> I just had this little purple Rocky Balboa. She just got her arms up straight up in the air with a purple face. <laughs> it's so good. And then you know, I used to be a really large person. I was a soda drinker for a long time. And I know that this is not something that anybody should admit to. But um, when I had a soda on the coffee table, Stevie would walk over and point at it. And I would say, no, baby, you can't have that. That's that's daddy's. She would just say, but I love you. And then <laughs> she would take a drink and she didn't say, please. She just said, I love you. And uh, I let her have a drink because how do you say no to that? She knew how to get what she wanted. <laughs> At the time, you know, I felt like, oh, man, I really shouldn't let her have that. But now I'm so glad I did. You know, she didn't have much time in this world. And every minute that she was with me and my family, she loved. So all of the mistakes that I made as a parent by letting her have soda or <laughs> letting her wake my dad up, you know, middle of the night because she's running through the house because she's not ready to lay down and go to sleep. It, it's whatever. I don't care that I made those mistakes as a parent because my two and a half years with Stevie were amazing. Every minute that we spent together was amazing. She made the most of it, and so did you, and that's awesome. I'm so glad she had that with you. Yeah. She used to carry my mom's cat, Charlie, around the house by his hair. Oh, my God. Is that the big gray and white cat in that one photo? <laughs> yep, that's Charlie. She would just pick Charlie up, and then sometimes you would just walk over, and you see Stevie laying on her belly on the ground, but you don't see Charlie, and then his tail just like will sneak out from between her legs. <laughs> and so she was just like body slamming Charlie. He must have been a good sport. <laughs> Oh, he was so nice to her. He loved her so much. And then she would eat like, I used to get the, the sandwich. It's called a gargantuan from Jimmy John's. And she would just eat my sandwich from the middle. <laughs> she would never eat from like the end of a sandwich, like a normal person. She would just eat right from the middle of the sandwich. Who has room for all that bread when you have such a tiny tummy? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then, um, of course, my memories with my mom and Steve and, and Stevie and my sister, her aunt Kimmy were, were like the best. We went to my sister's house and she made her a snow white dress and uh, she put her hair up in a pony ponytail because I as a girl dad I tried but I sucked at doing hair <laughs> and uh, of course you know she had all three of her cousins they all got to play together all the time and you know it was it was fun my mom Valerie her Mimi they would sit in the in the living room and and watch cartoons together and uh, you know Frozen even the part in the beginning of Frozen where they're chipping away at the ice blocks she would just be staring at me and my mom and, and the TV and just in awe just amazed by what was happening because she loved that movie so much are you guys seeing this yeah she's like, is this really happening right now guys <laughs> and uh, there's a part that I remember so vividly it's the clock where it's like and I would make that sound while we're watching the movie and she would just start hysterically laughing. And, uh, you know, there's just so few memories overall, but there's a ton in the short two and a half years. You know, so much time was put in with Stevie, so much love and so much you know, passion to be around her and be with her and, and want to spend every moment with her. But there's so many memories in two and a half years, but it feels like there's so few because we only had two and a half years. Yeah, it's such a short time in, in terms of time, but it's amazing. Those will be with you forever. Yeah, and then I'll touch on one last one, and that was that downstairs uh, that I sent you the video, too, of, of Stevie on my, my dad's dirt bike, her papa's dirt bike, and she just making the dirt bike sound with her mouth. And it, it is the most adorable little dirt bike sound I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> It is not at all accurate, but it is amazing. And at the end of that video, she says, Dad. And I watch that video all the time, and it just, I love it. You know, it's one of my favorite videos ever. The hardest thing that I've had to hear since Stevie passed um, actually came from my nephew. We were visiting Stevie at, her, at the cemetery at her funeral plot, and he asked me if we put her in the ground so she could grow. And I didn't know how to answer it at first because it broke me. Yeah. So that is like a, that'll break your spirit because the innocence of a child is so adorable. His only like frame of reference for planting or burying anything is so that it will grow. 
And to this day, I just think about that. And I, I think that like spiritually, absolutely. She's growing physically. She doesn't get to. So like she's growing <laughs> in a sense, but I didn't know how to answer that. And to this day, nobody has asked me a harder question. Yeah. I can't picture one. That's wow. And that it's so deep too. Yeah. And from, from a, at the time he was like three oh my God. or four, maybe it was a, a really tough question from a young guy. And uh, I'll never forget that question. Thank you so much for sharing so much about her with us. And I definitely will be glad to help you in any way I can to keep Stevie's memory alive. No, absolutely. And thank you again you know, for the platform. I will definitely keep you in the loop with updates. Thank you so much to Gary for sharing so much with me, and especially for letting us know who Stevie was. My deepest sympathy goes out to Stevie's family, who have no choice but to find a way to move on, whether or not they'll ever see justice served for their little princess. According to Stevie's obituary, on Monday, December 23, 2019, Stevie Osborne, cheerful princess and beloved daughter, passed away at the age of two. Stevie was born on April 28, 2017, in Kansas City, Missouri, to Gary and Abigail Osborne. She went on to spill love and happiness into the lives of everyone she ever met. Stevie had a passion for singing, and she adored stuffed animals. She loved to watch Frozen and Lion King while singing along word for word. Her beautiful voice will forever be playing in our hearts and our minds. She was known for her infectious smile and compassionate spirit. Stevie will be loved and missed by many, but the light she brought into everyone's life will forever be cherished. Gary and his sister Kimberly shared with me some utterly adorable videos of little Stevie, so I'm glad to be able to share with you some clips of her tiny little voice. Oh, that's a bug! Hi, baby. This is from the video Gary mentioned of Stevie pretending to ride her papa's dirt bike. Hey. Yeah. 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 You want a dirt bike? Yeah. Vroom. Yeah. Vroom. This clip features Stevie having an adorable conversation with her Aunt Emily. I love you, too. I love you the most. Are you not crying now? Me's not crying. Are you a good girl? Yeah, are you a good girl? I am! I'm your best friend. You are my I best love friend. You this much. Here, Stevie and her Mimi are making a video for her Aunt Kimmy. Say hi, Aunt Kimmy. Hey, Kimmy. Say, I miss you. I miss you. Say, I love you. You want me to send this to Aunt Kimmy? Uh oh. Kimmy. Where'd you go? In a couple of the videos, little Stevie got silly and affectionate with her Mimi. I want to end this episode with a sweet remembrance of Stevie by her Aunt Kimmy, who posted the following on Facebook on April 10th, 2020. I was cleaning the carpets today and had to intentionally leave a stain. A stain in your cousin's room that you made with the cookie I told you to not take to the bedroom. You did anyways, lol. But now I am so glad you did because it is just one more reminder that you are here. We all miss you so much. A talks about you all the time and never leaves out how pretty you were. R says you are still his best friend. M loves picking out flowers to bring you. And unfortunately, their baby sister has no idea of what an amazing, beautiful, smart, and silly cousin she is missing. But she will. I miss making silly Snapchat videos with you. My favorite one is still the one where you had a beard and you kept saying, I'm a pretty girl. Makes me laugh even just thinking about it. I loved how much you loved your cousins. I loved how happy you made your daddy. I loved that I got to plan both your birthday parties. I only wish I got to plan so many more. 
You literally were just this perfect little girl full of love and happiness. And though we did not get to have you here long enough, I am forever grateful for the time we had. Rest well, Stevie. You are so very loved, and you will never be forgotten. My sources for this episode were Ever Loved, The Associated Press, The Kansas City Star, 41 KSHB, Official Documents, the Your Missouri Courts Case.net portal, and Stevie's family members. That's it for this week. Join me next week for another episode. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com. You can support the show by visiting Patreon.com slash STLCPod, where you can become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to bonus content and exclusive gifts. You can also support the show at KO-FI.com slash STLCPod. Follow the podcast on Facebook and Instagram at Suffer the Little Children Pod and on TikTok at STLCPod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. Intro theme music is by Dreamnote Music, and all music for the show is licensed from AudioJungle.net. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit ChildHelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. And remember, if you see something, say something.